All people know about the Middle East, especially in America, is whatever the news is telling them. And it's all bad news. War, famine, geopolitical crisis, ethnic hostility, radical Islam, terrorism. But what people don't realize is that God is doing something magnificent across the entire region. You can see the light shining through the hole in his hand. That's Jesus, like, who appeared to me. This is the greatest job in the world. <laughs> Hundreds that are seeing Jesus in their dreams. It is a season of signs and wonders and miracles, and we're actually seeing it. And it's all happening in the context of this prayer and worship movement that's arising all across the region. And it's the story no one else is telling. I was pretty much born and raised in the church. More than that, I was a pastor's kid, which means I played in the aisles and slept in the pews. But my favorite part growing up was always the stories, and the traveling missionaries had the best ones. They were the most exciting because they were happening somewhere in the world now. They were so epic and mythical, it was easy to remember them. Always something about a chief in the Amazon jungle or a young girl getting miraculously healed. You get the idea. But the very thing that made these stories so easy to remember as a kid has made me suspicious of them as an adult. They're always told third hand, rarely with specific names, dates, or locations. I haven't lost my faith, but I've definitely grown cynical of stories like that. I mean, why don't they have more details? Where's the video proof? Well, a couple years ago, I met this guy named Randy. Great guy. And in the interest of full disclosure, a few years after that, I married his sister. Great decision. Shortly after meeting him, Randy started traveling back and forth to the Middle East a lot. And every time he would come back with these incredible stories. Stories about miracles. Stories about dreams and visions. Stories about people who were hostile to God coming to faith in Jesus. And these weren't someone else's stories either. These were his stories, and they were specific. And Randy's stories have flown completely in the face of everything I've ever seen on the news about the Middle East. ISIS, Al-Qaeda, Hezbollah, et cetera, et cetera. When it comes to the Middle East, it always seems to be bad news. But Randy keeps insisting there's an honest to God revival happening all across the Middle East in underground houses of prayer. And it's been gnawing at me because all this is happening just a few flights away. So a couple months ago, I asked Randy if he could go along, try to capture some of it on film, to prove to the rest of us that there's more to the story than what the news is showing. If he knows people with miraculous stories, I want to meet him. There's an underground prayer movement, I want to see it. And if there really is an honest to God revival happening in the Middle East, we're gonna film it. Well, this is the week. He invited me over uh, to be a part of an event they're happening. Uh, for the first time, believers in uh, seven different countries are gathering for prayer and worship for 50 hours in local churches, underground churches all over the Middle East. So I grabbed my bags and uh, my friend Stephen, say hi, Stephen. Hey. And uh, we're gonna go check it out. With our seatbelts fastened and our trade tables lifted, this is probably a good time to back up for a little more context. I met up with Randy last week before we left to try and get my head around everything we're about to experience and to ask him how he got involved in all this in the first place. 
what am I getting myself into here? Like, where, where? So we've been working in the Middle East for uh, six years now. Um, and we've been pioneering um, this idea of worship and prayer married to outreach and missions. We planted a church and a house of prayer here in Virginia in 2009. We just started with this dream of a place where, where the Lord was worshiped day and night. And so our real focus was on our nation. And the nations for me were always important, but they were very conceptual. So over the next few years, our community in our prayer room just started to get rocked with some of these uh, passages in the Bible and a few more prophetic encounters, encounters about what God was going to do across the entire Middle East. So it's June 2014. So I'm looking at the news in the prayer room. Breaking headline, uh, rebel, radical Islamic rebel army has just taken Mosul, the second largest city in northern Iraq. ISIS. ISIS. I'm sitting there and I, I flash back to an encounter I had with the Lord three years earlier. I go into like an open vision. It's really the only one I've ever had in my life. And I see this little tree sprout up and then it grows into this massive tree and it's horrendously evil and it touches the whole earth. We all thought it was just a little, you know, rebel army and all of a sudden it's a tree planted in northern Iraq and it's touching the whole earth. Mm. And the entire earth is terrified of it. Mm. And the Lord goes, I'm going to cut it down. If you do 50 hours, if you build an altar in northern Iraq, I will tear down the stronghold of ISIS. With only weeks to plan, Randy reached out to the only missionary contact he had even heard of in the northern Iraq region, a friend of a friend named Fabian. When Randy first spoke with Fabian, he shared the vision he had been having about an event of 50 hours of prayer and worship in northern Iraq. And it turned out Fabian's team had already been having the same dream. They said, we'd like to see 50 hours of nonstop worship and prayer in your city at the house of prayer in Iraq. And they says, we want to help strengthen the prayer movement in Iraq. And I thought to myself, there isn't a prayer movement yet, but there's going to be one. So Randy came with a team uh, from Fredericksburg, and that's when we did that first 50 hours. So we land in northern Iraq in September, Feast of Tabernacles, September 2014. About 30 miles from ISIS headquarters, about a month after the invasion, and uh, the city was overrun with three million, three million plus displaced people. We found a little church that the, that the house prayer leader there in, uh, in Iraq had been working with, building relationship. Consequently, because of the refugee crisis, there was 7,500 refugees living in the church. So they were in our prayer meetings, these refugees from Mosul. And they came to our city and uh, they had just lost everything. They've lost their homes. They've lost their businesses, they lost their car, they've lost family members. And as soon as they arrived, we had this 50 hours of worship and prayer. And we started, you know, as in a lot of intercession. And we go 50 hours nonstop of full worship teams. No exaggeration from the first strum of the guitar that first night, the glory of God filled that room. And we lived under an open heaven for 50 hours in the middle of one of the most dangerous and uh, chaotic crisis in the earth. And during the prayer meeting, these refugees were coming to listen and coming to watch as we were worshiping and praying. Day two, we're in the house of prayer, 100 refugees in the room. We're singing, we're prophesying, we're singing prophetically over the region of northern Iraq. All of a sudden, miracles start popping open. And it wasn't like, it, it wasn't, hey, let's do this slick altar call and, you know, bam, bam, boom, boom. You know, it was just in, in the presence of God, in the context of worship, God was moving. And the power goes out. What do we do? What should we do? And we kind of shrugged and said, why don't we just, you know, preach the gospel. I mean, these guys have been marinating in the, the presence of God for 24 hours now. I mean, let's see what happens. Let's see what happens. And I stood before them and I preached the gospel to them. And uh, they started raising their hands 
about wanting to give their life to Jesus. And I said, I need to explain this again to make it clear you understand what we're, what we're presenting to you. If you want to follow Jesus as your Lord and the only way, he goes, stand to your feet. And every single person in the room stood up. And I explained the gospel clearly. You're gonna follow Jesus. You're gonna lay your lives down for him. And they all started raising their hands and he led him to a relationship with Jesus. And they said, it's worth all the suffering and the loss we went through to experience and meet Jesus and have this life with him now. And at that point, we're like, oh my gosh, we're in a holy moment. God is teaching us something about what happens when we put his presence, we make his presence the primary tool in outreach and evangelism. So I came back, 2014, I came back, uh, and with our leadership team, we said, how can we, how can we train young adults, and then how can we send them to be a part of this story that God's unfolding, that God's already doing in the Middle East? Whatever that was, that's what we're gonna be doing until Jesus comes back. Mm -hmm. Whatever we just stumbled into is, is one of the, we know is one of the strategies that God's gonna use to release the, the great harvest across the Muslim world. Even up until the moment we boarded the plane, the plan for this trip has been in flux. The region really is pretty unstable. The news isn't lying about that. A week before we left, the border of Iraq was shut down. And just yesterday, there was an awful gas attack in Syria. But even so, Randy says our timing couldn't be better. Recently, several of the underground prayer houses he works with have been planning to host an event simultaneously in each of the locations. 50 hours of prayer and worship, and it's happening this weekend. So the plan is to meet up with them and film whatever we can. The closer we've gotten to the date, more and more underground prayer houses all over the region have been reaching out and wanting to join in. The idea for a united 50 hours of prayer has sprung up in almost every country in the Middle East. At this point, there are more locations than we can visit in the 50 hour window. So here's the plan. First, we're gonna to fly to Turkey to meet up with Randy and rally with some of his team there. Then we fly to Jordan to meet up with another team and kick off the 50 hours. After that, we fly to Lebanon for just 17 hours before finally heading back to close things out in Turkey. It's gonna be a long week, but we couldn't pass up the chance to see all this for ourselves. We just landed here in Turkey but from here on out, we have no clue what's about to happen. Here we go. Found Randy, but the cops already made us stop filming, so now we're in cognito mode with the iPhone. Maybe that's more acceptable. <laughs> So there was a visitor in the room who was Muslim. She stands up. They start giving her prophetic words. The secrets of her heart are revealed. She, and then she, and she becomes a Christian. She becomes what? a believer in Jesus. Yes, ye, not yesterday, <laughs> in, in church. <laughs> We were tired from the flight, but excited to get started. So Randy took us straight to the Turkish House of Prayer to get the lay of the land. Nestled quietly in a secret location, it serves as Randy's home base in the Middle East. <laughs> I was thinking slow down. This is a hike, this is a hike. <laughs> okay, so I'm here with my friend. <clears throat> I can't say where exactly we're at, but we're in Turkey, and we're like, what, a block from a mosque? About a block, yeah. Like about a block. We're at a house of prayer uh, that's been operating for how long? Uh, about five, six years now. Five or six years now in, in, the, in the heart of Turkey where every day people are praying and worshiping the Lord. So he's going to show us around. Let's do it. All right, come on. So this is the prayer room. Oh. So <clears throat> we're in here. It's just crazy. It's a super, super cool little spot. It overlooks the water and 
Just every day they're in here praying and worshiping. We do about 20 hours a week here in this room uh, of worship and prayer, and we get to sing it over the city. We get to pray over the city as we overlook it. Long before Randy's life-changing trip to Iraq, it was actually the country of Turkey that first jumped onto his radar. In 2011, while he was still just a pastor in Northern Virginia, Randy had a dream that changed his life and set all of this in motion. And uh, I have this dream, and in the dream, I'm standing in an airport in Turkey, in the nation of Turkey. And I'm looking out the windows of this airport, and uh, I see that look like an earthquake had hit the city. Rubble piled up everywhere. There's buildings that are toppled. And I see this rescue worker in a red vest. He's searching through the rubble. And he reaches into the rocks, and he pulls out this infant baby. And the, the baby's still alive. And everybody gets really excited. And I hear from behind me, the, in the dream, the audible voice of the Lord like thunder. It comes from behind me and he says, who will build the house of prayer in Turkey? And I wake up from the dream. And I'm sitting there in my bed. I wake up and I'm trembling. And I can still hear like just the echo of the thunder of this question. Who will build the house of prayer in Turkey? I, I honestly had to go look on a map. Like that's how unfamiliar I was with the region. About seven months later, in October of that year, I open up AP and it's the top story. And it has this picture, and in the picture, it's a picture of a rescue worker in the earthquake that went through the rubble and found an infant baby, and it was still alive. Just and it, like what you saw in your dream. The exact scene I saw in my dream seven months earlier. And I knew that that earthquake, that headline, was all God putting an exclamation point on the question he was asking me which was who would build the house of prayer in Turkey. I knew from that moment, it wasn't like a nice idea. It was a divine mandate. Because, you know, for five years earlier, I'd been sitting in the house of prayer going, Jesus, give me your heart. I want to know your heart. I want to know your heart, <laughs> right? And I'm thinking he's going to give me his heart and it's, it's going to be about revival in America. And it is, but he goes, well, you want to know my heart? I'm going to talk to you about what I'm caring about right now. And it's about peoples and nations and places you've never heard of before. One of the things that I love about you guys, I've heard so many of you guys say over and over again, is this mantra of, we get to do this. We get to do this. We get to do that. We get to do this. This is the greatest job in the world, you know? So, and, uh, so it's a joy engine, not a duty engine. It's a joy engine. And so when we say joyful missions, we, we get to do this. Like, God's gonna take the willing, God's gonna take the ones that just say yes, and he's gonna sign them up for a journey, an adventure is what you called it, that will, that will blow their minds. It'll be beyond their wildest imaginations. After a night of wrestling with jet lag, we met back up with Randy and headed down to the docks. With everything ready to go for the 50 hours, many of the worship leaders from the House of Prayer had taken their songs and prayers to the streets. So I'm here with uh, my new friend, Cheatham. This is Cheatham. Hi, guys. And Cheatham is uh, a worker and uh, a worship leader yeah. in the prayer and worship center. And she is from Turkey. Yes. So she's going to take us out for food tonight. What are we going to get? All the kebabs. And we have some, like, brain soup. Ooh, brain yes. soup. So good. Is that exactly what it sounds like? Yeah. What kind of brain do they use? Cow brain, maybe? I don't know. I'm a little bit nervous about that. I mean, <laughs> but I'm it's good. Anything, it's but... good. You will like it. You will like okay. it. As we walked, Cheatham showed me around her city and shared her story with me. 
Like most Turkish children, Cheatham was born into a Muslim family, but at a young age, Cheatham's mother became a Christian. This angered her father so much that he threatened to kill them before finally abandoning the family for good. Cheatham was only three years old at the time. I was angry at God because God didn't do anything my, when my father said that I'm leaving. So um, I wanted to kill my father because mm. I like one day I found out that my father is in prison. I will go there and tell him that how much I hate him and one day I will kill him. And I went to prison. In that moment, I had a huge encounter from the Lord. While I was walking down the hallway, I, I felt like the Lord was calling my name. Mm -hmm. I felt the Lord was saying to them, I love you. I know that you are angry, but I forgive you. I was I was actually getting ready to say I hate him, but I couldn't I couldn't say that. Mm. I couldn't say after feeling God's love for me. Mm. I couldn't say I hate him. Dad, I forgive you. I love you. I know you did bad things. I know you tried to kill my mom, but I, I just forgive you. There was a worship gathering in Turkey. It was day and night worship time. So when I went there, Ranet, one of the leaders from Maps Global, came up to me, show me a letter. In that letter, was Ranet was saying, I know how you feel about your father. But in that letter, she was also saying, that, like, your, your dad is gonna be God. God is gonna be your dad. How can this can be possible, you know? Mm. And then... Because you hadn't told her any of that. No, no. I I saw her for the first time wow. in my life there. Randy and Renet, they prayed over me. Turkish women, they don't get that much attention from their fathers. And when I saw God, when I see God as a father. It was something that I never experienced it before. That was the first time that we had gotten into Turkey after the dream. Now, as a, as a worship leader, as a woman in a Muslim country, I watched you lead worship today in public yeah. <laughs> and pray over people and preach some, yeah. share the gospel, and you were shockingly bold. How has God given you the guts to do yeah. that? It's just joy that God gave us. I know it's it sounds scary that we're in the Middle Eastern country and like we're living in a life that like people think that, oh, we're always in the fear and we're afraid to tell people that we're a Christian. It's not like that. We, we're joyful here because we know where we're going, you know? It's not that scary. It's actually joyful to do that. It's, it gives you life that you just, I don't know how to explain it, but like, it's, it's joyful. I'm, I'm so intrigued by this verse in Mark 14. Um, where Mary Bethany, uh, it's Passion Week, so it's the week Jesus is going to the cross. It's, it's the early in Passion Week, and he's sitting around the table with his disciples, and Mary breaks in the room, takes this box or this bottle of perfume, this ointment, breaks it open, pours it on Jesus' head and on his feet. In today's value, $30,000, $40,000. They said it was worth a year's wages. And the disciples go, oh, why this weight? Why are you wasting all of this? We could have used this for ministry. And uh, Jesus goes, leave her alone. She's done a beautiful thing for me because she actually knows the moment she's living in and she values my presence. She's prepared my body for burial. Mm. You see, Jesus up until that point three times had told the disciples that I'm going to Jerusalem, I'm gonna be arrested, I'm going to the cross, I'm gonna die. But there was only one person that actually heard what Jesus was saying. Mm. And it was Mary who who just a little bit earlier, when Jesus first visited Bethany, was the one that chose to sit at his feet and listen to his teaching. She saw something about Jesus 
she felt something about his presence, him being there in, his, in her house that was worth all of that in that moment. And he, Jesus says, craziest verse, he says, and wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, the story will be told of her. And he puts Mary of Bethany right in the center of the end time missions movement. And so you go, why? Why, why Mary of Bethany becomes the prototype for the end time missions movement? And the answer is because the generation that will finish the task of the Great Commission will go because they saw and felt Jesus the way Mary Bethany saw and felt him. They saw his worth. Those will be the ones that take the gospel to the ends of the earth because the price tag disappears when they see his beauty. That heart of worship is what missions is supposed to produce in the nations, that the nations would in turn see his worth and break open their bottle of perfume in worship and all the nations begin to sing one song before the throne. You are worthy, Lamb of God. And so the worth of Jesus is the fuel and it's the finish line of missions. That's good. You like that? That's good. That's good. Well, I could talk about that all day. <laughs> Seeing the house of prayer and hearing Cheatham's story had us excited. We couldn't have imagined then, but we had barely begun to scratch the surface. In locations all across the Middle East, preparations for the 50 hours were now well underway. But before everything kicked into high gear, I still had a few things I needed to understand about the House of Prayer and what Randy refers to as the Singing Missions Movement. For millennia, Christians have mainly been sent out on missions solo or two by two. I needed Randy to explain why they had shifted that paradigm. In these countries where there are so few Christians, why send teams of singers and musicians first? And, and I really appreciate and honor what's been done. But God's insisting that intimacy and worship not just be unto missions, but be the very fabric of what missions is. So that we have laborers that can sus be sustained for the long term. So why, why, why a house of prayer? Why a corporate expression? Why do you need a room to facilitate the saints together saying, Jesus, we adore you? All throughout scripture, you can see this the power of when the saints gather together and sing, something dynamically different happens. I'm thinking of 2 Chronicles 20, Jeho Jehoshaphat. The armies come against Israel. It's way bigger than Israel can handle. Do this. Take the singers and the musicians, put them out in front of the army. And when they start to sing, the nature the name and the nature of God. The Lord is good, his mercy endures forever. When they start to sing and play, it's, it was gonna, re it released confusion and they're destroyed because of the singers and musicians. Whew, that was a hike. <laughs> the house appeared for this next wave of laborers that's coming while they go through some go through the hard work of language learning and cultural assimilation and becoming, you know, another culture. From day one, they're in a, they're in a watering hole. They're in a familiar place where they're constantly going back to that one thing and they're being refreshed in the presence of God. You can turn the camera up there. A song can reach so much more than just, a, you know, a sermon. The house of prayer makes nowhere the hardest and darkest place. You can be in the middle of the most closed country, but if you're with a team gazing on the beauty, you're in light. So the house of prayer, the house of prayer in, its, in essence, crushes the idea that any place is too hard and too dark. With everything set in Turkey, we packed our bags and caught a red-eye flight to Jordan. 
where we plan to meet up with another one of the MAPS teams and kick off the 50 hours. Put it on automatic. Did you do that? Oh, sweet. So we um, we just got here to Jordan, and we just arrived at the prayer house, the house of prayer here in Jordan, which I'll show you later. But right now, we're gonna go to lunch with Saliba. He leads he leads the house of prayer here, and uh, we're gonna go get some lunch. We're gonna get to know him. Yeah. We're gonna hang out. And uh, Saliba, this is Saliba. This you is him. my name. No, I already said it. I just, you. I just said it. And you I walked over. You I'm gonna re rewind this and show it to you. I think it's the first time Saliba and I met was Saliba came to one of the 100 hours that we were doing in North Iraq. He had heard about what was happening in Northern Iraq, so he came and spent 100, 100 hours with us, and our hearts connected, and he said, I want to start a hop at Jordan, so that was like three years ago. There it is, it's that little green, it's that green. You're here. Oh, that's good. The amount of dreams and visions that we've, we that we started having since the prayer room opened, it's just crazy. We're not used to this. We're not used to this. God is speaking to the community, left and right. Uh, we've seen come to faith in the prayer room. In fact, we're baptizing one next week, actually. Um, he had a dream about Jesus, and then he showed up in the prayer room. Then we started discipling. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is this is a big deal because this has, like, for four years before the hop was opened, like we were laboring and none was saved. We haven't seen one conversion. And then since the hop was open, we've seen so many either like come by themselves to the church or to the hop. We've like we we've, we've been discipling three or four uh, at the hop, and now we're baptizing the first next week. Do you feel like? Uh, this breakthrough, this shifting happening, God is pleased. What was your professional? Uh, aeronautical engineer. The rocket scientist. It sounds way cooler than it is, but... Starting a hop. You're gonna lose it. This is people in the ring. Say, God, just give us one faithful person. Raise a prayer. Jordan. Rocket and It's easy. Anyone can do it. It's a rocket science. What do you feel like the role of singing is in the missions movement? Through singing, through worship, uh, we connect with God. Um, this is how He shares His heart, I guess. I mean, the Bible talks a lot about the Lord dwells, inhabits the praises of His people. Yeah. I don't even have theology to convince us. It's just what the Bible says God loves, and He likes it. Even the Bible, like whenever a prophet wants to prophesy, he'll bring in a musician to, uh, to start playing, and then he starts prophesying. It's just what the Lord does and loves. So it's his idea. After talking with Saliba, we met up with the team for one last prep meeting. We went over a few details, and before I knew it, the meeting quickly segued into a time of prayer and worship. It was my first chance to see a house of prayer in action. It began like most worship services I've ever been to, but then there was a pivot and it changed into something different. There was a new exciting energy in the room. The musicians were spontaneously creating new songs and the entire crowd was following right along. It managed this impressive balancing act of two elements that don't normally mix. It was both collective and spontaneous. Here's how it works. Musicians begin leading the room in a familiar song as scripture is read and prayed aloud to focus everyone in on the same topic. 
Then the singers start to spontaneously create a new song to express what is being read, until everyone in the room joins in singing and praying together. The immediate effect was an energy that sustained the room in focused, united prayer for hours. It was exciting and powerful to watch as everything bounced back and forth between languages, cultures, and worship leaders without missing a beat as they sought together the heart of the Lord. It was a community alive with a new song in the presence of a real God. The 50 hours wasn't supposed to start for another day, but we were getting a head start. We just woke up this morning, Trump tweeted that he's gonna launch missiles uh, into Syria. Tonight? Tonight. They, would they be attacking tonight? Yes. <sighs> yes, it's gonna be 50 hours in every location simultaneously. Are you working with Saliba in Iman? Yeah, Iman? yeah, I'm with, I'm with Saliba right now. Okay. Okay. The day that we're starting this burn, we're doing it for the next three days, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, is the very day that the US, Britain, and France are con deliberating on whether they're gonna go to war in Syria. So we're already pre, we're already positioned to pray this through um, without even knowing what was gonna happen. The civil war in Syria has been going on for over eight years. The conflict has left over 360,000 people dead and more than half the country's population displaced. Tonight's proposed strikes were in response to deadly gas attacks last week in a town called Kanshakun. It was alleged that Syrian dictator Bashar al-Assad had ordered those attacks on his own people to try and quiet the rebellion against his regime. President Trump's announcement this morning had started a domino effect of countries lining up to take sides. If nobody backed down, there were concerns this could spin into another world war. Early on in the 50 hours, the Syrian people have been scheduled to be one of the key points for intercession. But with this morning's developments, it had jumped to the top of everyone's list. We had planned to pray for justice in Syria, but couldn't have imagined the stakes or the timing. It felt like things had been perfectly lined up for just this moment. Believers in every country surrounding Syria were ready and committed to pray through this tenuous moment. With several of our locations 30 miles or so from the Syrian border, I was a little shocked at the lack of conversation about emergency evacuations or contingency plans. Instead, the team was working to sharpen the agenda for tonight's kickoff to be even more focused on interceding for Syria. These people didn't seem surprised to find themselves positioned at the center of a global event. It wasn't the first time, and it wouldn't be the last. Later that morning, with the looming conflict still in the back of our minds, Randy said there was a few more people I should meet before the 50 hours kicked into full gear. Sarah, Yazin, and Dania are all worship leaders in the Jordan House of Prayer. Like many others in this region, their families lost their homes and land to the Jewish state. The hostility towards Israel among their people has remained strong to this day. In fact, I was told that having an Israeli flag on display in Jordan would be like hanging a Nazi flag in America. It's hard for many of us Westerners to imagine what it's like to open a Bible and see your most hated enemy spoken of so highly. I asked Sarah, Yazin, and Dania to help me better understand and share with me what's been happening recently. I am a Palestinian Jordanian. I come from a Palestinian background and we've always, you know, had this hard feelings toward Israel. We used Israel as a first name actually. Really? We grew up in a community where people just hate them and like they think that they took uh, our land and all of these things. It wasn't until a, a, a brother um, from the States that I actually came and opened up the scriptures with me in a time of crisis in my life. My uh, uh, dad had passed away mm -hmm. then so. and I was offended by the Lord because I've believed the prosperity gospel where oh. you know everything is about you it wasn't easy for me to, to accept at first I was really uh, opposing to this and then uh, um, little by little the Lord was changing my heart one day it was the first set we had at, uh, in the house of prayer mm -hmm. and it was uh, on Yom Kippur, Yom Kippur. I just raised my hands and said, 
Lord, whatever is on your heart for those people, I want to receive it. Yes. And in one minute, just like the Holy Spirit just fell on me and I was weeping and weeping for hours and the set was over and I was like, yes, and I don't know what happened, but the Lord, He loves them and He mm. wants them to get saved. Yeah, I started miraculously loving these people wow. between my, you know, the four walls of my room. Um, it just, it's a pure work of the Spirit because of, I've never, you know, dealt with them. I didn't look up their good side. It was just the pure scriptures, the Jewish scriptures, and the Jewish Messiah working in my heart by, by the Holy Spirit. Um, that I started, you know, loving them. I have love for these people and I believe like, yeah, we're here to provoke them into jealousy and we pray for their salvation. Well, I have come to, uh, you know, see that a partial hardening has happened to Israel for their disbelief, but the Lord is resolved to provoke them unto jealousy by showing Himself to their enemies. So, you know, one, <laughs> one day thinking that I'm, you know, Palestinian, you know, irrelevant to the Jewish story, started seeing myself as actually possibly the means unto their uh, uh, provocation and uh, their um, um, uh, deliverance and coming unto the Lord eventually. Wow. Mm. So you, you had a Christian brother and he, he saw your heart. He said, I know you're struggling against blaming God right now. Not only can you not blame God for your father's death, but also you have to love Israel. <laughs> <laughs> about Jesus now. Amen. It's more about Jesus now. He's, he's a Jewish man and it's his kinsmen, you know, that are rejecting him. So it's not about politics. It's about a Jewish man from Nazareth sitting on the throne and coming back who loved us until death. So we're following our new friend Seda and uh, we just uh, sat and talked over uh, tea and coffee about what God is doing in Jordan. And it for sure blew my mind. Uh, I think I've laughed harder today and been on the verge of tears just about all day because what God is doing here is so mind blowing. Um, I can't wait for people to hear about it and see it because they don't even, you don't even know, you don't even know what he's doing here. With only a few hours left till the official kickoff of the 50 hours, Randy took a moment to help give me a little clearer context for what I was about to see and how meaningful it was to be seeing it here. It's pretty, you know, just stunning what we've heard even in the past 24 hours being here, you know. We're seeing a, a scenario emerge in this generation that God is um, kind of set up from the beginning that's meant to stun us all. It's meant to shock us. And it has to do with Romans chapter 11, verse 25, where Paul goes, Brothers, I don't want you to be unaware or uninformed of this mystery that a partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. And in this way, all of Israel will be saved. And he describes the second coming. This is really the last great unreached people block in the world. I mean, the Muslim world and Islamic peoples make up the majority of the unreached people groups. 1040 window, all that. Majority of it. I mean, these nations are unreached for a reason. We know where they are. We know how to get to them. The reason the gospel hasn't got to them is because we've been unwilling because they're hostile scenarios. Mm. They're hostile nations. They're resistant to the gospel. This is the first generation I'm talking about millennials. First generation in history that actually can calculate and know if they finish the Great Commission. We know where the finish line is, and the finish line is in the 1040 window. So Romans 11:25 makes it impossible for someone to be an Israel person without being a Muslim world person. Mm. And it makes it impossible for someone to be a Muslim world missions person without being an Israel person. Because it's like he's reserved this moment where he's going to sweep across the Muslim world and bring a fullness in the Muslim world of, of uh, people groups coming into the kingdom. Then they're going to sing. The ones that 
the ones that were at war with Israel for the past millennia are gonna begin to sing and pray and lay their lives down because now that they've been recreated by the cross, they're a new creation. They're gonna serve Israel and Israel's gonna come into her fullness. If we had time, I could tell you about stories that are happening in Iraq, Egypt, Jordan, you know, uh, even in the West Bank, Nazareth, in these places, all these where God's beginning to touch former Muslim people, now believers in Jesus that are in the house of prayer, that are beginning to feel his heart for Israel, unbelieving Israel, and are laying their lives down to serve their enemies. Isn't that the gospel though? To serve their enemies into their fullness. Yeah, yeah. And that's gonna what's gonna provoke Israel to jealousy because they're gonna go, why would you love and pray for us? You're Palestinian. You're Jordanian, you're Turkish, you're Arab, you're Iraqi, you're Egyptian. Why would you pray for us? And the testimony will be because of Jesus. Mm. Like we're literally watching the power of the cross completely change the landscape mm. of the Middle East. This is the gospel. This is what the gospel does. Mm. It takes the sons of Ishmael and the sons of Isaac and it joins them together in Jesus mm. to love and serve each other. Mm. It was one thing to hear Sarah, Yazin, and Dania's story, but listening to them lead worship that night was one of the most affecting experiences of my life. Yazin's voice was beautiful, but the words of this young Palestinian could not have been more powerful as he boldly proclaimed, only one has been found worthy, the lion of the tribe of Judah. We will worship the root of David. It could not have been more clear. The power of prayer and the faithfulness of a real God were at work in this room healing an age-old division. Whatever might happen next, I had already seen a miracle. As our room filled up, packed rooms all over the Middle East were joining in and focusing together on praying for Syria. They were powerful prayers, but it was a complex issue. No one could be sure if these strikes would help bring the war to an end or be just another round of suffering. But the room found agreement in trusting God to do whatever it took to bring justice. And out of that agreement, a new song rose up for Syria. Now is the time, this is the day, let mercy break in. It was posted that the U.S.-Russia conflict is uh, is di is dialing down because the, the Trump in Moscow are pulling back the rhetoric, so they're pulling back on all of this talk about looming war in Syria. Um, That's insane. In the very moment that we are praying, come on, dude, we get to do this. So we're just right here. We're waiting. We got our stuff together, waiting for our ride. We're gonna go catch a flight to Lebanon. At this point, the 50 hours has been going a little over 12 hours. We should get there. Uh, it won't take long, it's a short flight, but it's exciting for two reasons. Um, one reason, because this is a brand new relationship for MAPS. They've never uh, really dealt with Lebanon before. We have a team. Yeah, yeah we sent a team. We have a team there right now. We're going to meet up with them, but it's the first team that's ever gone there. Brand new relationships. The second reason this is exciting is because this is probably the, the best chance we have of getting turned away or, or, or detained. <laughs> <laughs> so um, there's a problem where if you have uh, an Israeli stamp on your passport, they just don't let you in. Yeah, it's run by Hezbollah, if you've ever looked that. If you haven't looked that up, search it. And I went to Palestine uh, just two years ago. And so Randy had told me, dude, if you have that uh, stamp in your passport, <clears throat> we're probably gonna be in big trouble. You're in trouble. Thankfully though, it wasn't a stamp, it was a sticker. So... I just took the sticker off. Looks like our ride's here. Here we go. <laughs> 
right. Made it. So far, went out of the building yet. So I thought maybe T-Mobile won't work, so I Google mapped the directions and I memorized them. So I'm going off of memory right now. <laughs> That's what we're relying on? <laughs> you're, you're jet lagged, not slept we're good, for dude. three we're nights. We're good, I'm like 70%, which is high for me. I'm 70% sure I know where I'm going. <laughs> I'm rarely ever 70% on anything. Yeah, 70% is high, I'm 70% sure I know where I'm going. Man, this is gonna be difficult just to capture anything we're here for 17 hours for the mountains yeah look at that. just happened let's get an update real quick well we got stopped by the military and the secret police and the secret police so pretty much hezbollah so they pulled us over went through every single picture every video a guy with a giant AK-47 didn't speak English. The other guy in the car, the, like the older officer, he spoke some English. He was cool. He was secret police. He was secret police, okay. So, I mean, all in all, relatively cool to us. We were playing it cool here, trying to reassure one another. But truthfully, it had been a serious and sobering moment. Something about being yelled at in a foreign language at gunpoint made it clear. We were in new territory. The soldiers spent a while going through our gear and deleting a lot of our footage from that morning. And after 45 minutes, we were surprised to be let go. Checking in at our hotel was another ordeal. By the time we were finally allowed to go to our room, we were pretty sure that someone was at least keeping an eye on us. Nothing was coming easy in Lebanon. We finally found our way to a local burger joint to meet up with one of the leaders of the prayer movement here in Lebanon. And right when we started to worry that our excursion to Lebanon might be a bust, there's too much tension. Nuno walked in. Nuna and her husband, Michelle, have spent the last 19 years helping to start prayer houses across Lebanon. If anyone was gonna show us what God was doing here, it was Nuna. So we're about halfway through right now the 50 hours. Yeah. How's it been, how's this 50 hours been so far? Like, what are some of the highlights? I heard the prayer room was really good this morning. <laughs> yeah. I, I heard we missed all the good stuff. You missed out, really. The time with the team was amazing. Uh, they're so prophetic. We also had invited many of the Iraqis and, and Syrian refugees mm. that we're working with. For, for them, it was the first time that they ever came into the such an wow. environment because we do Bible studies with them. You know, it's, a, it's more, wow. it's not a prayer thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But when they, they came and we started to pray for Iraq and yeah. pray for, they were, it was, for them it was, Life-changing. Life. Changing. life. It was something yeah. that they never experienced in their lives. We actually uh, just invited them on the microphone and just to be bold and this, we said, whatever you pray, you know, just pray. And we told them, you have authority over your own land. Well, they were crying on the microphone and just asking and asking for different governments, asking for revival in the land, asking for... It was an amazing. One of them even said that you know, coming to Lebanon is the best thing that's happened in my life. Mm. Wow. Like you lose your home, you lose your job, you lose your money, you lose everything, you lose your security. And then this is the most beautiful thing that happens. I couldn't understand this, but I... Because they were actually meeting Jesus and encountering God. So isn't that a good start? Wow. Such that's a good great start. <laughs> What's the grand finale going to be? <laughs> As we made our way over to check in on the 50 hours, Nuna made us a promise. If we had come to see what God was doing in the Middle East, she would show us. We barely had a chance to catch the action in the prayer room before Nuna introduced us to Zanid. Where are you from? Uh, I'm from Virginia in the United States. Mm, okay. Yeah. After having all this pain in my heart and suffering alone, um, I, I, prayed for, I prayed to God a lot, but it's like I, I, I didn't have any answers from my God, from my Allah. I was, I was covered. I, I covered for four years. Really? I, I was practicing my, my Islam. I grew more depressed even, really? even, even practicing my Islam. So I said, God, help me. I need you. So I got a dream after four days of Jesus. Really? Yeah, sitting on a big white rock sitting in a lamb posture. 
he was just looking ahead. And I was waiting eagerly. I want him to look at me. To see you? Yes, yeah, see me. He's not seeing me. Then one guy on the right side tells me, tells him, Zainab loves you so much. Immediately, he turns and in, looks into my eyes. And then white beams goes from his eyes to my eyes for, for some time. I hugged him and I started crying. After waking up, I, I started being happy. I thought, Jesus, I'm so happy. I was so happy. <laughs> so I started uh, receiving testimonies from a Muslim who saw Jesus in visions and dreams and became follower of Jesus. Uh, I saw a testimony of, of one girl. She saw a vision of Jesus carrying the cross all bloody and hundreds of uh, Muslims saw yes. Jesus in dreams and visions. Just like you. Just like me. So I said, oh I'm not God. alone. I'm not alone. So that's real. So, oh my God, I, I, sh I need to believe in Jesus. He is the son of God. We all would have liked a moment to process what we had heard. But just as the knee was wrapping up, a line had begun to form just off camera. People had heard while we were there. They had stories to tell and they were waiting for their turn. I know like hundreds that are seeing Jesus in their dreams. The beautiful Jesus appeared to me in a dream. Some big fire came inside me and shook me. I was consumed by those people. I was shaking. I didn't even know what, what that is. That's Jesus. That's Jesus, like, who appeared to me. And I started to tell him, Lord, forgive me. I'm so sorry, Jesus. Wash me with your holy blood. And he put me on my knees. And I started to cry like a baby. There were actually four families living in one tent. Wow. God revealed himself for them and told them, like, I want you to get baptized. I, I don't know what baptism of the Holy Spirit is. I don't know God speaks. I don't know I could actually have an intimate relationship with God. I, I only knew about Jesus, but wow. So many people are dreaming about the man in white, and they just need somebody to explain to him who the man in white is. For the rest of the day, it was nonstop. As soon as one person would finish telling us their story, another would step forward. On your, uh, can I put this right here? Yes, be free. Okay. We had traveled a long way with the hopes of catching just a glimpse, but for the next eight hours, we were overwhelmed. And the Middle East, all the Middle East, the Lord is moving. And they're amazed because we used to hate them. All these kids are getting encountered yeah. by the Holy Spirit. Yeah. They're all weeping. People are thirsty for God. They have experienced him. They're at the point where they don't write the stories down anymore because there's too many stories. Wow. Like every week, somebody had a vision, somebody had a dream, somebody got healed, you know, some mir miracle happened, so they don't even write it down anymore because it's so commonplace. And there are the, who are getting healed. Can I pray that the pain in your back goes and the pain in your back goes? Can I pray that your foot is healed two days later? My foot is healed. All my pain is gone and I can walk. I was like, hallelujah. When I finished praying from him, he threw out the pills and he threw out the drugs. He said, I feel like I am free and I don't want to touch them again. She always takes the inhaler before going to sleep yeah. or else she cannot sleep and she cannot breathe properly. Mm -hmm. Prayed for her once, she never used it ever again. As she said the name Jesus, he just felt this shock of pain go through his back and he got up and he walked out. Everything has just changed. Like there is an openness that we've never seen before. People are coming to faith at ridiculous rates. People are open to the gospel like never before. The season we're living in is the season that we've all been dreaming about for generations. It is a season of signs and wonders and miracles and we're actually seeing it. With our hearts and minds full and our batteries running on empty, Nuna insisted there was one final story we had to hear. She introduced us to a missionary named Julia, who had been ministering in one of the Syrian refugee camps just that morning. So uh, I went this morning after the 50 hours of prayer had been going for mm, 12, 16 hours. Okay. Um, and we went and visited a Syrian lady that I know in a camp uh, very near the border. So these are and Syrian, right? These are Syrian like ladies. Christian background or Muslim? No, they're Muslims. Okay. And she was in so much pain, and I guess because they were pregnant, she was pregnant, they wouldn't even give her meds. So we prayed for her. I, I feel like there's an invitation from the Lord. If you want to ask for a vision, you'll get it. And they said, yeah, we want that. So I just prayed for them and asked them to close their eyes to so just focus on the Lord. And they're both like gone for like 15 minutes. And I said, did you see anything? Did you see a vision? And then finally she said, if I tell you, you won't believe me. And I was like, no, no, I'll believe you. And she said, yes, I saw a man in white, a sheikh wearing a white robe. She felt very comfortable with his, in his presence. He actually came and hugged her. He took her by her hands, and there was this lake with still, still water, just beautiful lake. And he took her by her hands and dipped her under the water. And under the water, she felt so 
comfortable and peaceful and so yeah. happy. Yeah. And then he pulled her up and then he, um, like he touched her head and kind of like, like this, just sort of blessed her. Mm -hmm and she wanted to go with him. And she says, oh, and by the way, his hands had a hole in it. And you could see the light from behind, like the light shining through the hole in his hand. <laughs> and, and I said, well, do you know who that is? Like, do you, that's, that's Jesus. And she's like, really, why? So I Googled a picture of Jesus with Neil's guard hands really quick. <laughs> Jesus, there's a theme here. Kind of in the context of the 50 hours, like yeah. worship and prayer yeah. starting to I mean, the whole region. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I was at the 50 hours last night, and yeah. so was the other girl that was with me that prayed for her, and we thought wow. nothing had happened until <laughs> suddenly wow. there's 50 hours, and guess something did, so. We had a rough start in Lebanon, but it had proven to be the most inspiring stop of our journey thus far. As we attempted to grab a few hours of sleep before our next flight, I couldn't help but see a correlation between how much harder it was to do gospel work here and how much more fruit there was. We had seen more joy and hope in Lebanon than any other place we had been so far. And I was excited to see what was going to happen next. As we headed to the airport early the next morning, we heard the news that missile strikes had taken place while we were asleep. But they seemed to be a precise attack aimed at preventing further civilian suffering, and a greater international conflict had been averted. Things were still a bit tentative as we made our way through the airport, but after 17 furious hours in Lebanon, we were finally able to catch an early morning flight back to Turkey for the close of the 50 hours of prayer. What I had seen over the last several days had shifted my perspective in so many ways. I was simultaneously more hopeful and more aware of how complex it is to do mission work here. As we made our way to find some coffee, I asked Randy to help me understand what it's gonna to take to spread the hope of the gospel throughout the Middle East. So now we're returning to the discussion we started with about the worth of Jesus. And it, and it boils down to where are we spending our money and where are we sowing the best of our young people, because that's our, the future. Just under 7,000 unreached people groups left on the planet. It's about 40% of all the Earth's people. Just talk about American evangelicals alone. If they sent five out of every thousand of their young leaders to the field, we would have enough in America alone, we would have enough to send a team to every unreached people group in the planet. It gets worse with the money. Average American middle class, the percentage of that median income that goes to global missions is 0.001%. So a penny out of every hundred dollars. When you're talking about unreached missions, it goes to 0.00001%. God designed the gospel to expand in the whole earth, carried by the radical generosity and sacrificial lives of the church. It's designed to link everybody together in the cause of the Great Commission. Everyone is called to missions. You're either a goer, you're a sender, or you're disobedient. There's, not, there's no other option. One of my favorite characters in, in the whole Bible is this guy named Barnabas. It's a couple years after Pentecost. The church is exploding with growth, and there becomes a need. In order for this to keep expanding, it's got to be financed. And then a man named Joseph, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field that he had and came and laid the proceeds down at the apostles' feet. And that's the first time we find out about Barnabas. Nine chapters later, about a decade, about a decade to 13 years later, the revival breaks out in Antioch, which becomes the missions hub. And they send word back to Jerusalem and they basically say, help, we accidentally started a revival, we need help. And, uh, and I can imagine Peter gets the letter and goes, oh wow, something's happened in Antioch. And he looks around the room, he's like, does anyone, anybody want to go to Antioch? And he's like, Barnabas, why don't you go to Antioch? Barnabas goes, we get to do this. <laughs> and so here's, here's where I'm going with this. Radical generosity, it doesn't just fuel missions, it qualifies you for assignments that you don't know are coming in your life. 
And when God was looking for a leader to birth the first missions movement, he looked to the guy who sold his field. He sold a field and he got a city. No, Barnabas sold his field and he got nations. Like, everywhere that Paul went, Barnabas inherited. Yeah, yeah, that's all on his tab. It's all on his tab. <laughs> and it started with radical generosity. With a little bit of time left before the close of the 50 hours, Randy wanted to make one last stop to meet up with his friend, Pastor Ali. Ali is a native Turk who converted to Christianity after a radical encounter with Jesus in his 20s. He currently pastors two churches and is one of Randy's oldest friends in the region. Randy said Pastor Ali could help me understand why he remains so confident about the future of mission work in the Middle East. I got a phone call. He's an imam. He's a still an imam, active imam in a mosque. He began going online and searching about Jesus, and he, he, he read the Bible, and he listened to those sermons and preachings and teachings on video, on media, and he wants to give himself to Christ. And he says that, how come he didn't see it? How come he didn't notice it before? that Jesus is the Lord and Savior. Majority of the people are already heard about the gospel through internet, through media, wow. watched a couple of videos, seen other people, how, read or heard or seen other, how other people came to Christ. Yeah, you remember last Sunday when our team was prophesying? Was there a lady there? We're, we're trying to get... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, that's the story that I have been telling, the kind of a model, just example of what, we, what I have been telling to yes, you. Like please. she grew up in a Muslim family. She wasn't a very conservative Muslim, but she was not happy with the things that going around around her. She thought that there is much more in this life than what she sees. So she goes on internet, I don't know how, but she finds my videos. She listens carefully those discussions. Like she already had so much through media, already. So she came to the first meeting, and then she, last Sunday, she also saw the dynam dynamism that we have through the spirit there, the, the life that there in that room. So when we ask her that if she wants to give her life to Christ, she didn't hesitate. Yeah, why not? This is why I'm here for. And she did. Did, did our team give her prophetic word? Yes. It's not, a, it's not a something that is a unique thing. You see it it's everywhere. Wow. It's very common. Muslim background. Yeah. Are they coming to faith? Yeah. There is an openness, openness to hear openness to discuss, openness to, not to argue, but kind of talk about the fates. Unfortunately, the, the perception outside of the, this part of the world, outside of the Middle East and, and Turkey, is that this, these things aren't happening. But they are. The, the, of course happening. It's, yeah, of course. Cause, cause God is alive. Amen. Yeah. Thank you so much. God bless you, brother. Nice to meet you, too. After talking with Ali, we headed back to the prayer room for the official close of the 50 hours. When we arrived, the room was packed. We had lost count of how many countries were participating, but it was exciting to imagine so many rooms just like this one, all over the region erupting with the same spontaneous and collective energy.
Now we've got to look at it and go, well, what needs to happen? Because if you look at Matthew 24, 14, where it says the gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed in the whole world as a witness to every nation, ethno-linguistic people group, and then the end will come. If you look at Matthew 24, 14, those words are in red in my Bible, which means it's going to happen. Someone is going to have to look down at Matthew 24, 14, put their eyes on it, look up at the Muslim world and go, I don't want to miss out. I want to be a part of this. Just like Jesus did, sent from heaven, left the culture of heaven to be incarnated among a different culture called man. And he says, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. So what's it going to take? What's it going to take? The truth of the matter is that the church in America is not set up to handle the amount of singers, musicians, and young leaders that God has anointed in this generation. There's not enough stages. There's not enough stages in America to steward what God is releasing in this generation. And we have to ask the question, why? Mm. It's because it's not four stages in America. It's for prayer rooms across the earth to be going night and day with anointed worship covering the cities of the earth. The reason for Pentecost, Acts 2, the reason for Pentecost wasn't to have a sweet, spicy meeting. It was that you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. I've stopped trying to help people figure out their callings because they're living in a false dichotomy where they go, well, is, calling, is God calling me? Should I, should I, you know, do a short term or should I do a midterm? Should I go for two years? Should I? You can either waste your life or do something. Like if you're 20 years old in America and you can like play four chords, you probably will never get on a stage. But here, if you play four chords and you can sing to Jesus, you're like a nuclear bomb in the spirit. Because there's no one else here doing it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when I'm looking at an 18-year-old, 19-year-old, and they're like, you know, what do I do? What, what's God calling me to do? I go, just do something. Jesus is worth it. The gospel is powerful. And the time is urgent. Just do two years. You'll be 21 when you get back. Your life will be completely transformed. And then do whatever you want, but do something. Don't, don't waste the strongest years of your life sitting around trying to figure out what to do. And so we're praying and we're believing for an outpouring of the Spirit on campuses, on high schools, that sweeps up a generation and they see the beauty and worth of Jesus and that becomes the fuel and the finish line of their lives. Right back to that. Right back to it. Can we grab a battery? Yeah. Enjoy. So grateful for him. Oh, there he is. <laughs> ah. At the airport. We've done everything this week except sleep. That's true. <laughs> Very true. The journey through the 50 hours has been a paradigm shifting moment in my life. It turns out what you see on the news about the Middle East is true, but it's only part of the story. They're leaving the best part out. Maybe the forces of radical Islam and ethnic tensions are at work here, but so is a real God. I've seen it with my own eyes. There is a genuine move of God happening in what most consider the darkest and hardest place on earth. And anyone who wants can join in and take part. Thinking back on the traveling missionaries I heard as a kid, most of their stories ended with a heavy-handed emotional call to action. They would talk about need and duty they would say that the gospel compels us to get involved. But thinking about all the miraculous stories I've heard and all the joyful people I've met over the last week, getting to come here didn't feel like a burden at all. It felt like a privilege. And I'm headed home excited for the next adventure. Not because we have to do this, and not because we need to do this, but because we get to do this.
from heaven, came down and became a man. You know, good job, Stephen. It's like Jesus did me, sent from heaven. <laughs> oh, and then my lucky charms. What about with me when I'm drinking? Is that, that's a gross sound probably. <laughs> Is this gross? <laughs> Is that a saying? <laughs> I mean, I, literally, dude, I feel like I'm a pro. I'm just like, look at that. God bless China. God bless America. <laughs> <laughs> this commercial break. Your story is very valuable. Uh, you hear that? Follow up like this. You have to do like this. Hey, so, say like the first two things. Say the first two things. Fat bush, yeah. and then we get to do this. Come on. <clears throat> so, just finished having uh, chai. Yeah, yeah, which uh, turns out in Turkish means tea. Tea. So now it figures when we're back in the States and we say chai tea, we're actually That's... saying tea tea? Yeah, essentially, yeah. Yeah, which sounds like something, you know. You probably don't want to drink. Sounds something little kids call their grandma. Tea tea. Um, yeah. Or not. <laughs> <laughs> so you want to hear this one? With two espresso. Yeah, okay, now we're talking. We gotta, <laughs> we gotta pray tonight. Oh Jesus, help me this morning, Lord. So, let's start from the. Uh, let's start. From, let's forget all that.